Good evening, everyone. Welcome to night four of the 41st annual Ohio State University Jazz Festival. We're glad you are here on what promises to be a special night of music making. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our corporate sponsors, Cardinal Health, Gamayan Heart Musical Instruments, and L.A. Sachs. How about a hand for those folks? We've had a wonderful, wonderful uh, festival thus far. We had all the college uh, ensembles, the combos, and the, the two of the jazz ensembles, jazz big bands play today. Tomorrow is gonna be high school band days, and in the morning and into the afternoon, we're gonna have high school bands from throughout the central Ohio region come and perform, and they're gonna have a clinic on stage, and then they're gonna have a clinic backstage. It's gonna be a great, great day for them. Uh, some awards for best soloists and different things like that. Tomorrow evening is going to be a performance by the Ohio State University Jazz Ensemble playing the music of and conducted by Lad McIntosh. And so that's gonna be a really cool concert. That's gonna begin at six o'clock. So we hope you can come back out for that. To begin tonight's concert, we're gonna have some words from Professor Emeritus Ted McDaniel, Dr. Ted McDaniel. And I, I'm sure that most of you don't need an introduction to Ted McDaniel because if you've been to concerts here at Ohio State University in the past jazz concerts, you know that Dr. Ted McDaniel has been the mover and the shaker for this jazz program for the last 30 years. Um, he is just a, 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 a brilliant mind when it comes to jazz history, American music history, uh, jazz ensemble, and all things that are pertaining to some of the things that you're hearing tonight. So how about a hand for Dr. Ted McDaniel? opportunity to uh, return to this campus. Uh, I spent 35 years on this stage, so I recognize pieces of the wood. <laughs> We're sorry for the interruption, but we have something really amazing to share with our brother McDaniel from his fraternity, Phi Me Alpha Symphonia. Phi Mu Alpha Symphony Fraternity is a national organization founded in 1898 at the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. We were built upon the idea of bringing musical students together by using our talents to better the communities around us. Today, we continue the work of our founder, Asha Everett Mills, by going to hospitals and nursing homes all over the country and sharing the talents we have with those who need it most. We would like to take a moment this evening to honor a brother who throughout his life has displayed an outstanding commitment and dedication to his profession. He has demonstrated himself as a successful role model and exhibits high standards of excellence. Brother McDaniel, from this time forward, you will be recognized as a signature symphonian. With this designation, your name will join an elite group of symphonians such as Ellis Marsalis Jr., Gordon Goodwin, Wayne Bergeron, James Schwerenchen, George Shirley, David Holsinger, Vic Firth, Jamie Abersall, and Maynard Ferguson. To you, we present this medal. Let it be a reminder to you and a symbol to all of your contributions to others and your example to Phi Mu Alpha Sinfonia. We also have this great plaque here that says that William T. McDaniel of the Iota Gamma chapter has been recognized as signature symphonian in the field of performing arts and education by Phi Mu Alpha Symphonia for displaying outstanding commitment and dedication to his field, demonstrating himself as a successful role model and helping others realize their potential and exhibiting high standards of excellence in representing the fraternity as an alumnus. 
Please help me congratulate Brother McDaniel on his accomplishments and new distinction as a Senator Symphonian. supposed to speak after that. Um, let me just say thank you to Fami Alpha Symphonia, Symphonia. Um, I heard that list of, of uh, brothers and musicians whom I've always admired and looked up to. Um, and uh, I don't know how my name got called in that list, but I'm honored to be a part of it. When I joined uh, Family Alpha 100 million years ago, <laughs> um, I was proud, and I still am, and I can't thank you enough um, for this honor. Thank you again. What I was invited to do here this evening is to talk about one of the most iconic figures in the history of music, period, uh, Charlie Parker. And I would imagine that most of you know something already about Charlie Parker because of the time constraints that I have this evening, I'm gonna just sort of cut to the chase and see if I can just give a little bit of a synopsis about his importance, uh, his, his influence, his meaning, his inspiration, how he has changed American music, and how he has been a, a beacon of inspiration to many. Let me first of all thank um, Professor Sean Wallace and his colleagues, my former colleagues here on the jazz faculty and also in the School of Music. Uh, I'm deeply honored to um, continue to be associated with this great, great university. Tonight's program, you're in for a, as soon as I'm done with my comments, you're in for a great, great, night of music because you're going to hear an aspect of Charlie Parker that most of you probably do not know. Because Bird was associated with bebop, and I want to talk about bebop here in just a few moments. Uh, but he was not so much associated with a string orchestra. We're very uh, honored to have the OSU Symphony Orchestra here. Um, assisting this evening, and it's, it's just a joy to see the collaboration uh, between the jazz area and the orchestral uh, area here. So you're in for a, for a real treat. Additionally, some incredibly talented and outstanding uh, guest saxophonists, all of whom have been inspired uh, and who know the music of of uh, uh, Charlie Parker. It, 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 it's, it's virtually impossible uh, for you to be a, a, a jazz saxophonist and not know Charlie Parker. I mean, you would have to conscientiously do something different because Bird, in many ways, uh, provided the vocabulary in developing this new language this way of speaking, this new modern music that came about toward the end of World War II during the decade of the 1940s. We owe so much to Charlie Parker. So thanks to all these guest artists whom you will be hearing from 
very, very shortly. Charles Parker, Jr., better known as Charlie Parker, affectionately known as Bird, one of the chief architects of bebop, the new modern style of the 1940s. As it turns out, bebop was not merely the next new jazz style. Bebop would not only endure but become established as the preeminent jazz style, standing among all those that preceded it or those that developed after its first emergence as the lingua franca, the common practice idiom, the common practice period of the art of jazz. At the center of this is Charlie Parker, the legendary bird. Charles Parker Jr. was born in 1920 in Kansas City, Kansas, at the age of seven, the family moved across the river to Kansas City, Missouri, and he died. He died on March 12, 1955, at the age of 34. What a sad, sad situation. I hate to say that. But I don't know of any other figure who did so much in that brevity of time and space. And so I'm going to just try to capture just a few high points about Charlie Parker. He was one of the great transforming figures of 20th century music, and the history of jazz is inconceivable without him. Like Armstrong, Beethoven, or Schoenberg, Parker was one of those ultra-rare originals in which a tradition's past, present, and future merge, in a musical culture where creativity and individualism are aesthetic, indeed ethical first principles. Parker was a landmark innovator. Bird is also one of jazz's most traditional musicians, and like jazz itself, his music was a wondrous synthesis of diverse and seemingly irreconcilable elements. Parker appears to have liked or found useful in any case almost any kind of music, and the raw material he refracted was a large and variegated mix. There was jazz, especially the great soloists, Louis Armstrong, Benny Carter, Roy Eldridge, Coleman Hawkins, Johnny Hodges, Lester Young, and less probably Jimmy Dorsey and Rudy Valley. There was popular music, including children's ditties, folk melodies, dance tunes, and Ten Pen Alley and Broadway songs. In his later years, Parker also developed a fondness for classical music and particular admiration for the modern composers Bartok, Hindemith, Schoenberg, Stravinsky. Foremost, however, was the blues and the robust milieu of black music in Kansas during the 1930s. Bird helped to solidify this modern idiom that emerged in the 1940s called bebop. The new music expressed the emotional realities of musicians coming after swing. Inspired by the possibilities inherent in new harmonic, rhythmic, and timbral resources, and by the carving exploits of their predecessors, the young lions of the movement created a music that in spite of its revolutionary intent and qualities was based squarely in the tradition of the African-American ring. The blues was this bedrock and propelling force, but in expressing the emergent values of a new age, these experimentalists did a number of things. Number one, they evolved a new harmonic conception using extended chord structures that led to unprecedented harmonic and melodic variety. Two, developed an even more highly syncopated linear rhythmic complexity and a melodic angularity in which the blue note of the fifth degree was established as an important melodic harmonic device. Three, they reestablished the blues as the music's primary organizing and functional principle. Four, returned the percussive sounds of the ring culture to their original place of importance. And five, expanded on the prevailing extension of improvisation from paraphrase to melodic invention by adding to it harmonic elaborations they described as running the changes, the perfection and proper use of which produce prodigious, prodigious improvisers. In this new music, 16th note and triplet figures character rhythm and momentum substitute chords of the 7th, 9th, 11th, and 13th enrich the harmonic structure and the tempi was sometimes outlandishly fast. The role of the drums changed from timekeeping to phrase making, emphasizing, punctuating, clarifying, facilitating, and assisting in a harmonic, melodic, and textual definition of the music. The drums from the drum chair. Hence, the music was fraught with semantic value, but it was a semantics unknown to the uninitiated, a new language with which they would have to familiarize themselves, one that signified like no other. 
These innovations constituted the bebop revolution that lasted for approximately a decade and established a style that was the primary jazz dialect from the 1950s through the 1970s. Charlie Parker moved through Kansas on to New York, then to California and back to New York. The year 1945 marked a turning point in Parker's career in New York where he led his own group for the first time and worked extensively with a young trumpet player by the name of Dizzy Gillespie in small ensembles. In December 1945, he and Dizzy hit the streets and there was nobody who could do what they could do. They changed the order of the music. Parker was among the supremely creative improvisers in jazz, one whose performances, like Armstrong's before him, changed the nature of the music. The force and originality of his style was such that many listeners rejected his music as no longer part of the jazz tradition. And as other jazz musicians took up and elaborated his innovations, the music sank to what was then its lowest ebb in popular acceptance. Only decades after his death did Parker share the elite aura attached to him by his fellow music makers and admiring jazz fans and began to assume a classical status in the popular imagination. Although Parker was an innovator, his music is rooted firmly in tradition. Like the Kansas City music he heard when he was young, his repertoire was built largely on a few musical models, the 12 bar blues, a number of popular songs, several jazz standards, and newly invented jazz melodies using the underlying harmonies of popular songs. A number of Parker's newly composed melodic themes based on existing harmonic and metric structures themselves became jazz standards, among them anthropology, based on the core pro progressions of Gershman's I Got Rhythm, written in collaboration uh, with Dizzy Gillespie. Now is the time, which is a blues, ornithology based on Morgan Lewis's How High the Moon, probably written in a collaboration with Little Benny Harris and incorporating a melodic phrase improvised by Parker on Jay McShann's Jumping the Bruise and Scrapple from the Apple. So he is rooted in the tradition. That is, he utilized resources that preceded his own significant innovation. Bird was important. <clears throat> what you're going to hear this evening will be some of the more standard quintet combinations that he did with his partner, Dizzy Gillespie, the trumpet player for a while, and a young Miles Davis, who often served with Bird uh, as part of the front line. So you're going to hear our very talented faculty members uh, who will be making up the uh, rhythm section and support uh, for, for the soloists. And then you're going to hear the theme of what this concert is all about, Charlie Parker with strings by this very, very fine orchestra. I want to talk a little bit about Charlie Parker and Strings for a moment. On November 30th, 1949, Parker entered the Mercury Recording Company studios in New York City to record his first session with an ensemble made up of violins, viola, cello, harp, oboe, and jazz rhythm sections. Although not as consistently inspired or influential as the combo, the particularly the Charlie Parker Dizzy Gillespie quintet, this session would have a tremendous impact on Parker's career and provided Charlie Parker with a different musical collaboration and engagement. Musicians need to be stimulated. And you can be stimulated as a musician from a variety of sources. And so they seek out being in situations different from the norm those truly creative ones. Who wants to do the same thing all the time for years and years and years and years? You need to be challenged. You need somebody to push you forward. You need to have to climb some hills. And being put 
juxtaposing the most creative improviser of his time, Charlie Parker, in a situation with strings, forced Charlie Parker to do some negotiating and renegotiating in how he could make the collaboration indeed successful. Parker's encounters with French critics and intellectuals during his 1949 May trip to Paris may have accelerated his desire to place his saxophone into new musical settings influenced by classical music. Certainly in Norman Grant's, Parker has finally met a record label owner who was able and willing to finance some of Char Parker's more expensive projects. At any rate, he was given a green light to the project, songs were chosen, and Jimmy Carroll was hired to make six arrangements for the ensemble, usually referred to as the Knight's theme, Charlie Parker, and strings. Several sessions were required to attain Re releasable takes on the six chosen pieces. Now, I'm not going to talk because I don't really have time and I, I, I really don't want to get into this this evening, but there are aspects of, of, of uh, Burr's life that were really tragic, really, really sorry, and there were aspects of his life uh, that he, in large part, was directly responsible for. I mean, if there's anybody who could determine his fate, certainly he could. And his life serves, uh, ought to remind all of us that we can be in control. What happened to Bird, and the reason why we only had him around for 34 years, and when you really put the microscope on the span of time in which he first recorded, and when he last recorded, you're talking about not much more than a decade. For a musician, for a black jazz musician to have that kind of signature importance and influence and be an inspiration to many who wish to be just as he was. The Grants Park and String Sessions have several parallels to Parker's dial recordings of American popular song. Norman Grants, like Ross Russell, was certainly a supportive in-studio producer. The strings repertoire of songs by Gershman, Vernon Duke, Richard Rogers, Cole Porter, Arthur Schwartz, and others is high quality, as the dial ballad repertoire had been. On the grand side in question, Park is again given the opportunity to state and decorate memorable melodies and improvise on good song chord changes. Now with a string ensemble, the arrangements had to be carefully planned in every aspect and largely written out, right down to the placement and length, but not the content of Parker's ad-lib sections. Out of 18 titles recorded in the studio by Park and Strings, 10 are comparable to the, diet, to the dial record ballads in tempo, usually slower. In only one of those 10 did Parker have a full unbroken chorus to himself, in a sense, Bird must have been boxed in. He must have felt, in some sense, constricted, you know, challenged in a sense to be able to open up his vessels of communication and uh, creativity uh, and 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 maximize all. That's that's what happens when you when you get boxed in a boxed in a corner. So you got to negotiate. You got to figure it out. You got to make it work some kind of way. And he did, as you're going to hear. Generally, he's locked into sticking close to the original melody for the bars he's assigned and then ceding the melody to other instruments, the violin, section, oboe, French horn, and such as specified by the arrangement. Of course, it's sound arranging practice to distribute the melody among several instruments. One would not expect Parker to be in the foreground all the time, given the possibilities that his expanded instrumentation offers. But given only three minutes on a 78 RPM record, the result is that on these slow pieces, Parker likely desired more space to blow. I'm gonna cite one tune here this evening. That's about all the time I have to do. It's called Just Friends. I think Just Friends is on the program tonight, is it? It's good, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful piece. And to my knowledge, uh, I believe this is the only time that Bird recorded Just Friends. Uh, I don't think he has another, uh, on a number of these numbers like Embraceable You, which he did with strings, you know, he has a quintet version of that. So, uh, you know, he was such a fluid player, you know, he c c climbed up and down hills 
uh, with such incredible flow and velocity. If there was one word backed up in the alley one night, somebody stuck something in my side and said, what would you say about Charlie Parker? What one word? I may say velocity. His life, when I look at his life, his life is full of velocity. He was always running from something. Always running for something. And you listen to his music, you have to know how to run because that's what Charlie Parker did. That's what he brought that changed the whole dynamic to weigh the modernists who came about in the 1940s had to play. So Just Friends is one incredible uh, song. Uh, it's one that Bird uh, just ate up. And one of the reasons why he had such a good time with that song is that he had an opportunity to expand. The tag brings to a close a well-integrated arrangement and performance that features Parker extensively in introduction, loose theme statement, full chorus solo, half chorus solo, and coda. Parker had thrived on this piece for several reasons. Just Friends was new material and therefore a fresh challenge to him. The arrangement allowed him improvisational flexibility. That's what all jazz musicians want. They want the freedom to fly. That's what it's all about. That's what bebop, that's what the bebop aesthetic is about, creative possibilities. There are no rules. There are conventions, but there are no rules. And if you can make it work, good for you. And Charlie Parker did that. Further, Just Friends presented the song's core progression in two successive keys, keeping Parker on his toes. Finally, the intro and coda, core progressions that did not derive from any familiar pop song encouraged Bird from his old well-worn improvisational licks. Everybody has licks. Everybody has conventions. Everybody has things that they say because that's part of your identity. That's who you are. Everybody has an identity. And Bird, of course, has one as well. Although the arrangements for some of the strings did not resemble the modern classical music Parker most admired. He never stated for the record whether the eventual arrangements were consistent with his original vision for the project. Parker loved the American popular song and was proud of his recordings with strings. And I quote, this is what he said, when I recorded with strings, some of my friends said, oh, Bird is getting commercial. That wasn't it at all. I was looking for new ways of saying things musically, new sound combinations. Why? I asked for strings as far back as 1941. And then years later, when I went with Norman Grant, he okayed it. I like Joe Lippmann's fine arrangements on the second session, and I think they didn't turn out too badly, end of quote. Today, it would not be unusual for a jazz artist to record with a string ensemble, but at the time, only a few jazz artists had recorded with such a group. Another significant achievement is that Parker actually toured with his string ensemble, a difficult feat for the jazz artist in any era. Now I say to you, just sit back, relax, and enjoy the Ohio State University Symphony Orchestra and these outstanding saxophone soloists and this stellar group of musicians comprising the rhythm section, all in the spirit of Charlie Parker and I'm pleased to give you with just one thing more, very quickly. Charlie Parker, Duke Ellington said, there are countless records and performances by innumerable artists in which you hear a certain phrase and you immediately see Charlie's picture in your mind's eye, in the quote. Nene Tristano said this, even before Bird had died. If Charlie Parker wanted to invoke plagiarism laws, he could sue almost everybody who's made a record in the last 10 years. <laughs> Charlie Mingus expressed the same thought in more picturesque language, and I won't quote him, I'll kind of paraphrase this. Quote, if Charlie Parker wore a gunslinger, there'd be a whole lot of dead copycats. More poignantly, on another occasion he said, of the copyists, 
I call them bird seeds. I'm talking about the Sonny Sticks of the world, the Jackie McLeans of the world, the Cannonball Adelis of the world. And I'd say if somebody calls you a bird seed, your response should be, thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, enjoy this evening and sit back and listen to Charlie Parker and Strings. Thank you very much. Tonight you're gonna to hear from five splendid, splendid alto sax soloists. And they're gonna be accompanied by this fine orchestra and some of my friends here in the faculty, Dave Powers on piano. <laughs> Kevin Turner on guitar. Andy Woodson on bass. And the guy who I wanna be when I grow up, Jim Rupp on drums. <laughs> Our first soloist is going to be Pete Mills. Pete Mills is a professor of jazz at Denison University. He leads the jam session at the Park Street Tavern. He's done that for many, many years. And he is a member of the Columbus Jazz Orchestra. In a moment, you're gonna hear from this wonderful orchestra, the Ohio State University Symphony Orchestra, members of the Symphony Orchestra, and their director, uh, David Becker. And this is going to be a splendid, splendid concert. So sit back and enjoy Charlie Parker with strings.
Hi, Vaughn.
soloist gets up here a little bit quicker than I was expecting. So uh, I'm going to give him a proper introduction. Dr. Michael Cox is professor of jazz studies and professor of saxophone at Capital University. He performs with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra. And something we have in common, we both have degrees from the University of Northern Colorado, which is kind of a cool thing. So uh, wonderful, once again, a hand for Dr. Michael Cox. Our next soloist is someone who's very familiar to everyone here. This is Sean Thunder Wallace. Sean Thunder Wallace comes to us. He's, a, he's actually a Columbus native who grew up in Michigan. We won't hold that against him, but uh, he's here now. Um, he is, of course, professor of jazz studies here at Ohio State. He's also the director of music at Vineyard Columbus. He has eight CDs under his belt. He's a multi-instrumentalist, and um, in his spare time, he hangs out with Moses. And I don't know if Moses is here, but uh, Moses is as cute as he can be. But um, how about a hand for Sean Thunder Wallace?
Thank you. I just wanted to make a quick, uh, quick correction. Um, I no longer work at Vineyard Columbus. I love my time there, but I am now the minister of music at Second Baptist Church. Um, also, let's have a hand for everyone. Doesn't this sound great? Isn't this, isn't this wonderful? Continuing on.
Our next soloist is J.D. Allen. J.D. Allen is a native of Detroit. He's performed with Betty Carter, Ron Carter, and Jelly, Jerry Allen. He has recorded numerous albums of his own for Sunnyside Records and for Savant Records. Please welcome to the stage, J.D. Allen. Thank you. 
Our fifth soloist tonight is Donald Harrison. Donald Harrison has had a long and distinguished career, uh, led bands with Terrence Blanchard, led his own bands, but more importantly than anything else, he wants me to let you know that he is the big chief of Congo Square. How about a hand for the big chief of Congo Square, Donald Harrison.
Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, how about another hand for the Ohio State Symphony Orchestra under the direction of David Beckham. The Ohio Jazz Tech. And we should mention that it's Charlie Parker with strings and winds and brasses and harps, so we don't want to short anyone back there. Splendid job all around. For those of you who don't know, just a little trivia, the oboe parts on the original recordings were done by Mitch Miller. Some of you are old enough to remember Sing Along with Mitch, the uh, bouncing ball, and you sing along, standing on the corner. Well, that was uh, the oboe parts on those original uh, Charlie Parker with strings recordings were done by Mitch Miller, so a little bit of trivia for you. Um, this last piece that is going to be performed was arranged by our trumpet professor here at Ohio State University. I don't, is Anthony Stanko in the house? Anthony Stanko is right there in the house. How about a hand for Anthony Stanko? <laughs> going to feature all of our soloists tonight. This is Kato Wiesetstein. I think I said it correctly. And they're going to come out and they're going to perform it. How about P. Mills, Dr. Michael Cox, Sean Thunder Wallace, J.D. Allen, and the big chief of Congo Square, Donald Harrison.
Thank you so much. Pete Mills. Pete Mills. Let's have a hand for Pete Mills. Michael Cox. J.D. Allen. J.D. Allen. The Big Chief. Donald Harrison. Big Chief. Kevin Turner. Dave Power. Andy Woodson. Jim Rupp. David Becker. The Ohio State Symphony Orchestra. And let's also have a, a hand for Charlie Parker with strings.